Well, uh, morning everyone. We made it to the final day of um, the formal large meeting. Uh, good to see you all. Um, um, I hope you have enjoyed your time here uh, in Brisbane at QUT. So bear with me. I had a double espresso just like 10 minutes ago, so hopefully that's working for me. <laughs> so, but yeah, really keen to share with you a collaboration that we had with uh, the Department of Agriculture here in Australia and really thanks uh, Galaxy because it has been one of the platforms that has enabled this conversation uh, to make an impact for uh, horticulture industries. So um, horticulture crops in Australia certainly uh, play a, a role in our economy. Um, um, it has been estimated that the value of the sector is around $14 billion uh, in the last uh, calendar year, and it's anticipated that that value will increase uh, by another $4 billion uh, by next year. So as you can see, um, Australia uh, all, all exports uh, to different regions uh, around the world, and these are high value markets. And from the point of view of our economy, we're really keen to protect uh, access to those markets. So how we can do this? Certainly, uh, you have experience of a few. Uh, thank you for coming all the way down to Australia. It can be a bit of a, a journey to come down here, but that journey also is applicable to exotic pests. So we do not have many of these pests in Australia. And we are really keen to keep it that way. And with the uh, more trade that is happening, more movement of people, and resources, we're really keen to continue to make sure that we safeguard uh, the industries. So uh, some of you may have experience um, coming in that, yes, uh, you need to be uh, across uh, quarantine regulations, which is perhaps for some of you may have been a, a culture shock. But yes, we are really keen to have those processes in place. And if someone tells you, sorry, mate, we misplaced your luggage, and uh, but actually it turned out that your luggage needs to be uh, screened for three years and we'll get back to you in three years. So probably you may not be very pleased uh, with that. So, and that is actually what is happening with our uh, industries currently. So any new germplasm that they bring to Australia, uh, they spend a really long time in quarantine testing and eventually they, they get uh, tested and released once it's safe and then they can start the businesses. So as you can see, as a business owner, that's not really something that is uh, of appetite because you can't keep uh, um, your, your, your market share, uh, either domestically or internationally. So we really need to make our industries more flexible or more agile to respond to market opportunities. So, but why this is happening is because um, we, uh, we, when we started this project, uh, the main uh, driving force for diagnostics is relying on molecular assays and serological assays and biological indicators that can take really a long time uh, to be performed. So um, in that sense, yes, we need to have an alternative that can be more scalable uh, to also improving new regulations. So we have uh, 217 viruses, which are of by security concern in Australia, and we need to make sure we look at all of these. There is also the challenges of if we continue to rely on uh, existing processes and technologies, there is less and less appetite for uh, new students to go and acquire those skills. So there is a decline in expertise, for example, in biological indexing, uh, shooting grafting. So. Um, if we want to be future proof, we really need to start to rely on alternative solutions. So we uh, engage with the Department of Agriculture, we listen to them to their pain points and uh, how challenging it is for them to cope with uh, new updates on what is being regulated uh, uh, throughout the year and they need to respond to these regulations. <laughs> So as you can see quite quickly, um, it wasn't just something that they can maintain and sustain to be able to address. So we decided we need an easier strategy. So can we tap into this um, uh, 
into a solution that can be sustainable. So we then realized quickly that uh, yeah, we can leverage from the, the host plant immune system. So plants have done all the work for us. So essentially, we did not need to do anything in ourselves because throughout the evolution, uh, plants have evolved to respond to infecting viruses. And they rely in these small RNA pathways, which is called RNA interference. And there are specific enzymes that respond to viruses. And one of the really nice features of these enzymes is that they can uh, recognize these viral molecules and fragment these molecules into quite a specific sizes. So when we are building um, data analysis strategies, we can rely on these specific products that we expect to be coming from the response to viruses. So um, today I would like to share with you um, what we've been working with the Department of Agriculture over the last four years or so. Uh, certainly COVID has been part of this journey, so we'll share with you as well that. And we were really keen to look at, yes, what HTS technologies, there are many flavors of HTS technologies that are being used. We had um, initially identified in the proof of concept uh, that Ennis referred to that a small RNA pathways might be the way to go for us but it gave us the opportunity in this partnership to step back and look at the bigger picture and see is this the best way forward because different agencies around the world they use uh, different approaches so we're really keen to look at the technology and then look at uh, running larger scale uh, trials to make sure uh, the processes work and then i would like to share with you a couple of technical uh, lessons that we learned in the journey and then finish up with uh, the policy adoption. So um, smaller than ACS, I don't really need to dive too much into it. Um, I think uh, it's a, a fantastic proxy when we are really keen to know whether a virus is actively uh, uh, replicating with the, within the host. Uh, it gives us that uh, possibility for us to assess uh, that and measure that activity. Uh, but one of the drawbacks of potentially relying on, on this strategy is some viruses have evolved strategies to suppress the RNAi interference in the host. Uh, although we don't see that is 100% effective in removing that activity, but there is a consideration. But also there can be uh, some of the viruses can be dormant and not really replicating. So relying on alternative approaches and technologies can provide us that uh, that uh, possibility to assess whether, yes, we should rely on the small RNAs or perhaps we should go and look at an alternative uh, strategy, which is, in this case, uh, ribosomal depletion RNA, I think it's a sensible approach. So um, we started with that initial question. Uh, we wanted to address which technology we should take forward. Um, we rely on positive control uh, uh, set of uh, plants that we knew. Um, what um, viruses and something that is called viroids. They are really small circular RNAs that are present in plants. They can range between 200 or so uh, nucleotides to 600 bases, and they can also cause a disease phenotypes in plants. So we're really keen to, to, uh, to look at these plants that are not only infected with viruses, but also with these smaller uh, viral uh, molecules. So um, as we started this journey, um, we wanted to uh, continue to work with the initial partner, and that was an overseas partner that we initially worked uh, to develop the proof of concept uh, strategy. But uh, looking at implementation and adoption in Australia, uh, it was not really sensible for us to think we can move uh, information overseas. So we needed to have a local solution uh, that can be utilized uh, if we were to adopt this technology. So we're really keen to start that conversation and we started to work uh, with a local uh, provider. So um, we start this journey of looking at the detection of these viruses using these two ap uh, approaches with the small RNAs and ribosomal uh, uh, HTS. And soon we started to see that we observed some differences of what is known from post-entry quarantine testing and legacy information on the selection of these positive control plants. 
So um, in the site of the small RNAs, we were missing uh, a virus which is called Citrus tristessa virus. This is a very interesting virus in Australia. Uh, uh, it has around in the world uh, about nine genotypes of CTV are present and we do have some of these genotypes in Australia which are uh, endemic but some of the genotypes of CTV are exotic so we uh, do test for CTV so that uh, we prevent uh, entry of new strains of CTV but the small RNA was clearly uh, not detecting any signal there and when we look at the alternative for some depletion uh, we did observe a minimum signal but it wasn't a strong signal to suggest that it is present. So when we did compare with the molecular assay from post-entry quarantine, uh, the sample that we sent for sequencing, the first one on the lane one there, uh, it was certainly missing. Uh, we could not detect a signal in CTB and also additional extracts from that particular plant also means that. So yes, it was certainly missing in that, uh, in that plant. And then, um, when we look at the ribosomal depletion, um, we did miss Hopistan viroid, uh, which is also another uh, pest of interest. Um, but when we look at the molecular assay data, we could detect uh, this. So we were not detecting a, in this particular uh, strategy that we utilize with this service provider, that particular uh, uh, pest. So another lesson that we quickly came to realize, and when we work with uh, these technologies, is that when we utilize public data, uh, we don't necessarily keep uh, the metadata information when the data is being generated. So sometimes when we generate data, we try to go and aim for low cost data generation options, but that could potentially impact uh, what you are detecting in your samples. And that is something that we've learned that there can be a phenomenon called uh, index hopping events or cross sample contamination. What that essentially means is when you have some signal that is strong in one of your samples, you could detect that strong signal uh, in other uh, multiplex samples that you have in that particular experiment and you can have a false positive. So we really need to be mindful on that. And uh, certainly uh, we did detect these two signals uh, with the small RNA sick in these control plants, but yes, as suspected, we could not really validate them. And when we look at the ribosomal depletion, um, yes, the initial uh, strategy that we use, it was a bit of daunting picture because we could see that a large fraction of the samples that we were testing were reporting these uh, false positive detections. So from the point of view of quarantine agencies, when we report to them, we found these, uh, they need to go on and inspect and assess and validate these. So as uh, so you can uh, envisage, that can be quite a daunting uh, uh, overhead on resource allocation to follow up this uh, erroneous reporting. So um, we were really keen to uh, improve um, this. So we started to partner with a local service provider and gave us the opportunity to test a strategy called dual indexing that can minimize uh, this uh, false positive reporting. And this was roughly about three years ago uh, or so. And we started with that uh, option. Um, the good news for us is that yes, we can detect all the pests that we expected to detect uh, with the small RNA seq strategy. We also detect everything that was expected to be detected with ribosomal uh, depletion RNA seq strategy, which was really good, including the Hopstand varroid that we were initially missing. And when we look at the cross sample contamination, uh, yeah, we, we saw a less daunting yeah, picture. We could see less uh, cross sample contamination with ribosomal depletion. We did not observe anything with small RNA seq, but uh, we then realized that it was because of the instrument that we were using back then. So next, next sick instrument are less prone to this cross sample contamination, but if you use Nova sick instruments, uh, you will start to see uh, this effect. So you need to be mindful on the instruments that you utilize. So uh, at that point, uh, we thought it's sensible for us to go ahead and utilize a small RNAs as the strategy going forward to start to use large scale testing and for enabling this 
conversation on this testing, we implemented two uh, analytical workflows. Uh, initially, we implemented a prototype workflow uh, using Nextflow. And as we learn more uh, lessons throughout the processing of the samples, uh, we optimize the workflow. And now this is uh, published and accessible to anyone. Uh, and GitHub is, is called Peer Report. And uh, that has been our initial prototyping of optimization. But simultaneously, uh, we also utilize Galaxy. And that has been really a fantastic resource to work with Galaxy Australia. Uh, because uh, most of the plant uh, molecular biology is at uh, post entry quarantine. They don't have this data analytics expertise. So for them, it was really fantastic that we provide them this Galaxy experience and interface so that they can see how the data gets processed and they have visibility to uh, all the intermediate information that it would be required by them to analyze and, and make a, a sense of what has been detected. Another resource that uh, we found quite rapidly important uh, to develop is um, a curated database for viruses. And this has been highlighted a couple of days ago that we need to have a uniform approach to dealing with public information. It was also the same for us when we work with uh, public uh, resources of viral information. Um, we, we defined our strategy that we needed to harmonize taxonomic information of the viruses as a way for us to make sense of this and make uh, a, a uniform approach to harmonizing the descriptors. So we utilize and adopted that strategy. Additionally, we uh, go and look at the taxonomic information that is assigned through uh, the International Committee for Taxonomy of Viruses. Uh, so we make sure that whatever is harmonized is compatible with uh, the expert uh, 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 knowledge and additionally we do what is called uh, we define representative uh, sequence for highly related genomes so when we're looking at public data as you can uh, anticipate there might be some minor differences in terms of uh, genomic data uh, and they can be uh, a little bit of a uh, uh, a challenge to make sense of what is detected and consistently. So what we decided is to remove that ambiguity in terms of what we are detecting and what we are reporting. So we decided to define what is a sensible uh, uh, representative sequence for highly related genetic sequences. And we use those uh, as references for diagnostics. And the benefit of doing that is that uh, it can uh, result in a very light database that can be used within Galaxy and is very effective in running these processes. So um, we, with those resources in place at different stages of development, we started the, the first season of testing and we secure access to 188 samples across different commodities. We started the first uh, set of of processing uh, when COVID essentially was starting uh, to be part of in our life. And initially we didn't feel the impact of it, but then soon after, yes, it was uh, starting to impact the supply chain for us to continue to do this work as resources were uh, being directed more to COVID testing. So we decided we need to build resilience. Uh, if we want to adopt this technology, uh, we need to uh, define strategies that can build uh, a more sustainable approach in Australia. So we'll get back to that in a moment. So we needed to go back to some of our uh, partnerships that we have overseas to continue to, to progress with this activity. And um, we learned a few lessons along the way. Um, and the, the more valuable lessons were where we were uh, not detecting uh, um, a pest that were detected through post-entry quarantine protocols. So we were able to, to have that first-hand knowledge access so that we can optimize our analytical pipelines so that we can uh, get to this 100% agreement uh, with the post-entry quarantine protocols. And that was really valuable experience for us. 
Another challenge that you can to realize when you are dealing with these uh, biological samples is that we have viral sequences that can be uh, integrated in host plant genomes. And one of those case studies for us was working with raspberries and this particular virus, which is called rubus yellow net virus. And we uh, reach out to Driscoll in US because they have been working uh, and they provide germplasm for raspberries. And they were trying to understand, make sense of um, how these viruses are being integrated into uh, their germplasm they are providing to industries across the, uh, the globe. So we got access to some of their early uh, inside knowledge uh, for us. We, of interest for us is the one at the bottom. It's an episomal uh, uh, strain of, which is of biosecurity concern. And so far, yes, we were not able to see any positive uh, yeah, detections for this. Along that journey, um, we also um, were able to detect new to science viruses and we uh, identified a new potivirus. Um, this is characterized by having a, a very long uh, polyprotein uh, and this is a, a bit more than 3000 amino acids polyprotein that encodes a range of, uh, of open reading frames that uh, sustain the function of this particular virus. And uh, we found that this was closely related to sorghum mosaic virus and also sugar cane mosaic virus. And we tentatively name it Miscanthosinensis mosaic virus uh, for review by the ICTV. So I did mention that, yes, COVID uh, was impacting um, our delivery of milestones within this uh, project activity. So we're really keen for us to, to partner with more uh, service providers in Australia, and we invite them to um, undertake at least two different um, uh, strategies where they can use, and perhaps they might be already within their R&D pipelines to use and deploy as new services to the community uh, so that we can test and assess which one might be suitable, which ones might be suitable. Ideally, we have some redundancy there. So what we learn is, uh, long story short, is that um, Cajun, uh, microRNA library kit having uh, with a unique molecular indexing and unique dual indexes was the strategy that was um, preventing this cross sample contamination that we did observe when we moved from uh, instruments uh, to a higher throughput. So we do recommend to utilize this uh, strategy Having said that, there are still opportunities for us to, to, to improve, and we'll get back to that in a moment. So um, we continue our testing on our second season uh, of testing. And uh, as we expect with most of these germplasm that it gets imported to Australia, uh, they tend to be quite clean. We only detected in uh, our, just around 8.7% of the imported plants. Uh, regulated viruses of biosecurity concern to Australia. So uh, it is important that we have those detections. And in addition, depending on these industries, they are interested to know which other endemic viruses that we already have in Australia uh, might be of interest. So at that time, we were looking at reporting some of these viruses of interest uh, for uh, specific industries so that we can provide that information so that they can make an informed decision whether they would like to build a, a, a business portfolio around that new germplasm that may have an endemic uh, virus. So um, as part of this, we also detected another new to science uh, virus. And I think there is opportunities to continue to, to build and have this resource available to the community. Um, it, it looked like a uh, potivirus, but it turned out to be a potex virus instead. And this is now at the moment under review uh, for publication. So um, a couple of lessons that I would like to, to share with you in terms of um, looking under the hood. Um, for us, it was really informative to optimize. When we are working and deploying and implementing end-to-end -end, uh, analytical workflows, uh, we were really, it was really informative for us to understand the source of the uh, genetic information that we were collecting. So because that allowed us to improve 
standard operating procedures from uh, sampling, uh, collect, uh, uh, collection of uh, RNA, but also library preparation. And we partnered with Kajan uh, R&D team uh, to implement strategies to try to minimize uh, the collection of non-informative data. Uh, we use a uh, ribosomal depletion strategy for small RNA seq data, which is not typically used. Uh, typically use this ribosomal depletion for longer uh, uh, RNA seq experiments. And it has been working uh, well uh, for us to deplete long RNA, uh, ribosomal RNA fragments that we can see in these libraries, but it still is not very effective at, rem at removing the smaller fragments of ribosomal RNAs that, as you can see, is still they're present in these libraries. So we're really keen to, to continue to work with them to define strategies that we can remove these non-informative information, uh, being ribosomal RNAs, chloroplast RNAs, mitochondrial RNAs, which are not really informative from the point of view of diagnostics. And if we are, uh, and we are in this uh, currently looking at implementing some new R&D strategies to try to specifically pull uh, a small RNAs that are derived from viruses. Another uh, aspect that we were initially thinking, what are our controls that we can use as part of these um, experiments is um, how we can assess cross sample contamination. And for addressing that question, we use an alien control and we use the Miscanto sample that I, I just mentioned earlier. That is a virus which is highly uh, expressed. Uh, so it's a really good candidate because uh, the signal from the virus is quite strong and can be uh, detected uh, in other samples if there is a hop, uh, index hopping event. Uh, but then uh, we are also interested to look at um, when we have negative detection of viruses, um, what are strategies we can use? And we decided to tap into um, a synthetic microRNA. In this case, we use the C. elegans microRNA 39, uh, which is, has no sequence similarity to any sequencing plants. So, and we use this uh, as our control uh, to also measure the sensitivity of detection uh, in, in these plants where we have negative signal of detection from viruses. So um, policy, uh, it's been a, a bit of a, a journey for us uh, to work uh, uh, and has been fantastic, the partnership with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, one of the uh, uh, blessings that we have when we work with the department is that they are really keen uh, to have long-term relationships. And um, the, the initial uh, trigger of this activity was when Mark Watham back in 2012 said, this is our pain point, um, viruses. We need better approaches to detect these viruses. And then we uh, uh, were uh, involved in, in that process. And we received this plant-based security CRC funding to develop the plant-based security, uh, the initial proof of concept approach. And we deploy the solution in something called YABI, which is, stands for yet another bioinformatics interface. And back then we thought, it was sensible to use that platform uh, because yeah, that was part of the, the platform supporting in our host institution. But then we realized that we need uh, to provide and build resources that are more accessible to the community. So hence, we use now other platforms to provide these solutions and access. And the journey that I'm sharing with you is the journey with, uh, that we had recently. We received uh, funding from uh, horticultural industries uh, to look into implementing this technology for routine testing at uh, quarantine agencies, and also how we can potentially upskill the team, uh, the, the molecular biologists, uh, plant pathologists within uh, the quarantine agency in the Department of Agriculture to have the expertise to adopt and utilize the technology for routine work. And I'm glad to report that December last year, we have formally uh, adopted uh, this technology uh, for the first year of commodities. And these are prunus, rubus, and strawberries. And this is in addition to ornamental grasses that we adopted during the proof of concept phasing. So, and we are starting to roll out now this as a routine service uh, at the department this year. And the plan is to 
uh, eventually ex expand these to other commodities. So, um, but all this is just possible because the partnership and the relationship, uh, the regular engagement. So we had uh, monthly meetings uh, throughout the, the last four years with the Department of Agriculture. And um, that has been fantastic to have some of the champions, Mark Watham, Julie Paramore, uh, Candice Elliott, and also Greg Murphy there in the picture, Adrian Diesel. Uh, all of them have played a major role uh, to engage different teams within the department, uh, uh, policy regulator teams, um, operations team, IT teams, um, so that we can all come to the table and work towards adopting this technology. Without that, them, uh, I don't think this is possible. And then certainly, uh, Galaxy. Galaxy has been a, a really instrumental interface and platform, and I would like to acknowledge all of you that contribute to having this resource available because that has been a platform for us to engage and communicate uh, with uh, the, uh, this stuff within the quarantine agency so that they can get visibility on how the data is generated, how to adopt new strategies and technologies. And we implemented uh, uh, resourcing material, uh, user guides, videos that allow them to use this technology. And now we're working with the IT team to uh, implement a portal. That, and this is an in-house portal. It's not available to external uh, stakeholders, but this is internally to enable them to have routine operations and run these uh, diagnostics uh, for these commodities that are currently adopted for HTS testing. So uh, from the point of view of what they need to do, uh, at the Department of Agriculture, we wanted really to streamline and minimize their hands-on involvement. Uh, yes, they were keen and excited and passionate to learn new skills, but we know how busy they are. So we wanted to really minimize their hands-on uh, um, involvement in the whole process. So all they need to do now is just basically co collect the samples and everything else is automated. So. The samples are sent to a service provider and the service provider provide us an email with a JSON file with the metadata information of the, of the samples and that triggers an automatic ingestion of the data. And that will trigger automatically the, uh, the processing of the samples. We send automatically the data to Galaxy Australia for processing. We fetch back some information from Galaxy Australia for further processing in the cloud. And once that is processed, we go back to Galaxy Australia and run a second set of processing to then generate this final report. Uh, and in addition to that, we have also this next flow uh, option. Uh, it's important to build redundancy and we have this possibility. So I think it's sensible to have this, from our lessons from COVID is yes, you need to build as much resilience and redundancy so that you can ensure operations are not impacted. So. That's why we decided to use and provide this to our uh, partners. So what are the benefits uh, for post-century quarantine and for horticulture industries? Um, we have a reduced, certainly, number of uh, assays that now they need to run for the uh, adopted uh, commodities. Um, we use currently HTS as a first pass screening. So that informs what molecular assays they need to be run on which individual samples so it is more efficient in terms of resource allocation uh, to clear those plans uh, in terms of quarantine testing it also uh, provides them some, uh, quality metrics uh, to inform their uh, decision making and uh, on these plans that are imported and the other benefit i think which was really important is when we have this partnership with academic institutions it's not only a research uh, collaboration, but also we can transfer that knowledge and expertise uh, back to the agencies so that they have that capability, in-house capability. And for industries, um, yeah, we see the benefits is cost savings in terms of this. It can be quite a, a, an overhead to import this germplasm and get it tested for. Uh, so we do see uh, that is one of the initial benefits for them, but more importantly, 
um, those cost savings could be used to bring in more diverse genetic germplasm that can uh, be used to, to test how they adapt to uh, the Australian environments and they can build a more resilient uh, business portfolio. Another aspect that I touch upon is, yes, um, we can look certainly at what are the profiles of, of, of viruses that can be in these commodities. And there is now the, and the visibility for the industries whether they would like to, to build a, a new uh, business portfolio on a particular commodity that doesn't have an exotic pest, but it may have something else that could be of, of concern for them to have a sustainable return in their investment. And now we're thinking on implementing some new strategies of how we could potentially implement strategies now that we know which viruses are present in this material, how we can assist in cleaning uh, those plants uh, from those viruses. And that is something that we are currently uh, interested to implement. And the biggest benefit in, in terms of profitability and ability of industries to remain competitive is having access more uh, faster to this imported material. So, and that is something that we're, uh, that is part of the, the journey. Uh, still we think we are in the process of, of uh, using HTS as um, in operations, routine testing, but we still need to rely on, on existing uh, standard protocols they have been using over the, the last few decades. So uh, it will take a bit of a time to have full uh, advantage of this technology, but we see once they are using this technology and these uh, other uh, available assays, uh, eventually they will move to adopting this technology as we know it it can be more uh yeah can be rapid in terms of detections and also uh as we build these uh, analysis pipelines that are robust reliable uh they can have the confidence that uh, they can build the business portfolio um and yeah have this material release earlier so um in terms of future perspective um Still, there is a gap uh, for data generation. Uh, there is a lot of data that gets generated and deposited in public databases, but a lot of this data is non-informative. So we need to really develop strategies in which we can uh, uh, generate data that is more sensible and uh, bespoke and can be used for addressing specific needs and initiatives. Uh, and we are uh, implementing, uh, we're testing, we'll be testing uh, with, uh, over the next couple of years, some strategies in a partnership with a new collaboration looking at seed testing over the next four years or so uh, to assess whether we can uh, make this more specific. The other uh, global initiative uh, which is important. Uh, it's good to have these operations uh, in, a, in, a, in a domestic setting, but the biggest impact is when we have this uh, understanding and harmonization of, of, of using these technologies across countries, across jurisdictions. So we are working in a UFRESCO collaboration. Uh, this UFRESCO initiative uh, is uh, engages 23 countries around the world. At the moment, we have 10 countries that are interested to, to look at how HDS is utilized for plant diagnostics. And uh, that is an, an initiative that will be rolling out over the next couple of years. And we are interested to have an, a, an understanding of the best practices and processes across jurisdictions so that we have a harmonization at the technical level. And then eventually we can move on to an, uh, a policy agreement that can facilitate trade. So the long-term vision uh, and from one of my colleagues, Mark Watham, is can we have a planned passport so uh, that can remove these barriers of trade? So, and that is something that potentially that will come in a few years. I think there are still a, a few building blocks that need to be placed, put in place. So from our lesson on implementing this technology in Australia, it took us a, a bit of a, an engagement uh, with policy uh, to get 
uh, to this stage. And when we are now looking at global adoption of these technologies, I think uh, we need to have that early engagement and champions within the individual uh, um, organizations to have that engagement that can facilitate this adoption. So uh, with that, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, QUT uh, um, and the team at QUT, Maria Emily, and the work of the report, Ruvini Lewala in the Galaxy implementation of the report, uh, Sachary LeBlanc uh, that work on the Miscanthus uh, uh, work and also in the implementation of the custom database, Craig Whittle with the implementation of the Nextflow solution um, uh, for this activity. Certainly, yeah, uh, Professor Ma uh, Matthew Belgard for hosting this activity here at QUT, Chris Williams and Hamish uh, on providing uh, infrastructure that enabled this activity. Our colleagues from the Department of Agriculture, uh, we are really keen, um, I have not all the names here, but some of our champions uh, the list is much longer than this, and we are really uh, blessed that they have been uh, involved in this activity. Um, Agriculture Victoria, Galaxy, uh, Gareth, Igor, thank you for that support uh, and throughout the journey, and our partners from Horticulture Innovation, uh, the, plan the initial CR plan based security CRC, and our colleagues from New Zealand that have been also part of this activity. Uh, and with that, yes, uh, I would like to thank all the people involved in this journey. Um, and yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Um, anybody has a question from the audience? Yeah, I mean, that was a really cool talk and really cool to see like, um, yeah, where you taking the analysis. I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting approach. And I actually, I have a bunch of questions, but maybe just the one that um, I'm most interested in. So how do you decide uh, which viruses are problematic? So when you do this type of analysis, you also mentioned that you find some novel or unexpected viruses in these samples. Um, but are you confident that you couldn't detect these viruses in endemic species? Because like, I imagine a lot of it is like barely studied. And then following from that, do you keep the, the raw data that you collected for retrospective analysis in a couple of years? Mm -hmm. Yes, good question. Um, yes, um, what we do is uh, we have a, a decision tree in terms of based on the HTS evidence that we collect for any of the detections depending on the quality metrics that we have defined, we can assign, when we have enough supporting evidence, we can assign to a specific viruses. Um, but then there would be cases where we have a low uh, express, also called low titer viruses that could be present. And when you are collecting this type of data, it's very uh, reasonable to think we can get a very strong signal. So we classify them into an, a different category, which is uh, a potential detection of those viruses. So what that would trigger in terms of the decision making is uh, we need a follow up uh, molecular assays to verify those cases that are matching, for example, uh, viruses of biosecurity concern, and specifically those are the ones of interest. So they can go ahead and run those assays on, on those. Uh, then there is another category, which is as you pointed, uh, potential these new to science viruses, those viruses that are divergent. And they can be uh, uh, more of a challenge because we rely on um, a small RNA technology. So what we can resolve when working with these type of cases is relatively a small fragments of their potential genome. So what we are now considering is implementing uh, Oxford Nanopore approach for those cases where we have those signals and we can use that initial information that we have to resolve larger portions of their genome. So we are working currently into a developing a, a follow-up uh, long uh, a, a HTS technology that can provide us more visibility on that angle. Um, but in terms of the, the data, uh, is yes, it's certainly quite important that we keep the raw data and this raw data is kept uh, um, as I, I just alluded that automat is an automated process that bring in the data to the cloud. And what we have is uh, an automatic archival of the data. 
uh, from the point of view of the policy uh, regulation, they wanted to have confidence that any raw data that has been generated has not been touched by no one. So that is part of their capital process. No, no one touches that data that is archived. And at the moment, we're considering to, to keep that data forever. Um, typically, depending on initiatives dealing with this kind of data, they can keep the data for seven to 10 years, typically. Um, for, for now, we've put in place strategies that can allow to have much longer uh, uh, retention um, cycles for those data sets. But yes, uh, it is important uh, to have this, uh, this uh, backup uh, data. And having said that, yes, we do have an, an alternative copy that we use for yeah, the processing of, of the pipeline, but yes. Uh, Um, great, thanks. Um, great talk, very important research. Um, I'm curious about your slide on the workflows where you have Nextflow and Galaxy. And we talked a little bit about this, but I'd be curious to know, um, were there elements or features in Nextflow that you found easier um, to do and perform than in Galaxy and then vice versa? Were there elements of, in Galaxy which you found were easier than doing in Nextflow? Yeah. Awesome, thank you, fantastic question. Um, yes, what we, one of the strategies where we decided to have these two flavors of deployments of the pipelines were for two different purposes initially. So we decided to have the next floor implementation because it's a, a very portable solution that can run on multiple uh, um, uh, compute infrastructure. So it could be the cloud, could be on-prem HPC, could be a local server, uh, and we were really keen to use that solution because you can upscale quite easily. Uh, you can run thousands of samples uh, without any changes to, to the code and can really upscale to any demand that may be required. So one of the, um, um, the pros of using Nextflow is that we can automate the whole process uh, from end to end, from the initial uh, use of the raw data all the way to the generation of the reporting. Um, then when we look at Galaxy, we use Galaxy for a different purpose, not real, uh, initially, not really for processing all this data, but for training. We're really keen to provide this training element to, to the personnel of the quarantine agency so that they have that visibility. Because as you, as you might be familiar with Nextflow, you need some digital expertise to go on and deal and make sense of that and access to those resources, uh, so which are not readily available uh, in the team. So we're really keen to use Galaxy uh, for that. Um, but one of the bottlenecks we found is that not every tool or not every option might be yet available in Galaxy. So that's why we ran an initial process in Galaxy. We go back to the, to the cloud and for the processing and then go back again to, to Galaxy to complete that process. Um, perhaps that may be one of the, uh, uh, the, the initial yeah, bottlenecks that we have experienced. Having said that, um, I think it has been really informative for us uh, uh, to use Galaxy um, to provide that accessibility to the end user. And I think it's important to have that engagement uh, with the users because at the end of the day, they will be making decisions um, on the evidence. So, and what we work towards is to have the same information coming through Galaxy, but also uh, this next flow. And having access to these two, it provides them redundancy in terms of, uh, as we experience as users of Galaxy, sometimes we have some maintenance, uh, for example, that we may not be available to use some of the servers and if we are pressed for time, we can rely on Nextflow, but Nextflow can be potentially a bit more cost uh, demanding uh, on using those resources, cloud services. So in that sense, yes, it's really good to have Galaxy as well available. Then maybe I have a follow-up question. Um, how, 
I mean, would it make a difference in the development of pipelines to you if you were able to more easily um, just add in a command line um, and run it as a tool? So like you take a script, maybe you have an interactive way to like see if the script works and if it does, then you can just use that as a tool. Is that something that would be interesting? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that will be really able to provide a lot of facility for the community because um, we implement these in-house scripts for processing of the data, whatever that processing might be. And you have an easy way to incorporate that into Galaxy. I think that will be very useful. Another aspect I was initially chatting is having these histories. Um, so we process about 400 samples in this project and looking at 400 histories can be a bit of an experience for someone to go and look and make sense of that information. So having the possibility to have a script to go and fetch reliable, I mean, the information that is needed uh, to make sense across all those histories and uh, merge that and combine that into a single history, uh, that will be also very useful for us. So. Uh, we can go and fetch these uh, outputs from all these individual uh, yeah, runs and go back into having a single site where we need to go and, and look. And that would be also of interest to us. Oh, you, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, just briefly, that you know this is sort of big business and if there's delays in this or probably you know errors in this this costs some people a lot of money i noted that you know i know that a lot of the sequencing providers you use do diagnostic services and they're accredited mm -hmm. can you just comment on the need for accreditation of the computational environments that you're doing the analysis on as well and how do you mm -hmm. you know how do you ensure that mm -hmm. they're doing what they're meant to be doing thank you a fantastic question again um, as part of, uh, I haven't alluded to this, but as part of the implement adoption of this technology, we need to implement the standard operating procedures end to end along the journey of the, how the data is dealt and uh, also data, uh, the generation of the data. Because we can say small RNA uh, is the way to go. And, um, and with UM, uh, unique molecular identifiers or unique, unique dual indexes, we find that combination to be the most sensible. But um, as you go and, and rely on different uh, service providers utilizing that, it may not necessarily yeah, get you to the same outcome. In principle, it should, but not necessarily there is warranty that that can happen. So as part of this process, we have a, a set of positive control plans. Uh, so, and that is, uh, at this stage, we've worked with this particular service provider, working with this um, positive control set of plans, that we've optimized and we know we can detect. So there is that evidence. But if we were to go and work with a different service provider, then we'll need to go through that process where we, yes, we need to make sure we are still getting the same information. And yes, and that is part of, part of the process uh, for us. So that can be certainly a challenge. So initially, when we started to use different providers, we thought we should get similar results, but not necessarily. And also this can be impacted because you could be using, for example, a Novasic X, and that is a much higher throughput instrument where you may be processing your samples along X number of people. And that can also impact what you are detecting. So yes, we need to have that uh, visibility of what else has been uh, added to the multiplex experiment in that particular run. So we would recommend, yes, not really. I mean, yes, it's certainly from the point of view of cost effectiveness, yes, it's good to use these larger high throughput instruments, but from the point of view of ensuring that making sense of what signals we observe, we need to have that visibility of, of the metadata of the samples that we're using that particular experiment. So, and that needs to be considered when looking at uh, uh, making sense of this and also yeah, having this accreditation uh, although that is not a formal conversation yet, uh, that needs to, we need to engage that accreditation, but I think it's, it's really sensible that we have that. All right, well, uh, 
So I think I'm glad that I typically I talk too much. So I try to to cut a lot of things uh, a lot of things from here because last time I talk I went a bit uh, yeah without any time for questions. Um, so yeah, with this I would like to thank the this is my first Galaxy um, uh, conference. So really thank you. I would like also to thank you you all for developing this resource and making it available. Uh, to the community. As you can see, this is just one little case study where it has been valuable for us to yeah, adopt the, a particular technology to hopefully make a difference uh, to businesses and increase their yeah, uh, ability to be competitive, profitability. I mean, there are more impacts than this because as we reduce the incursion of this pest, uh, we can also protect our nature, our environment as well. So thank you all.